So hello, and welcome to this interview with the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. Before we get into the substance of all of this, Maximo, you've had a, a fascinating career, and I, so we thought it would be just great to hear a little bit of your personal background that has uh, sort of got you into this position of trying to help solve these massive problems around food issues. So Maximo, welcome, and uh, over to you. No, thank you very much. It's very nice to, to be here with you. Of course, I am Peruvian. I did my undergrad in Peru, but I did my PhD in UCLA. And what I specialized in UCLA was an industrial organization. So my PhD dissertation is about birth of semiconductor and biotechnology companies. And also, of course, I have work on development. I did a couple of chapters on, on rural development and, and how we can combine industrial organization and, and, and technology into improvement of, of rural areas and reduction of poverty. And I think that's what gave me a different way of looking at things, uh, because I don't look at them as a traditional agricultural economics will look at, at the problems. I look at them more as a, an economist trying to figure out uh, how we can convert agriculture in the agribusiness sector and where are the bottlenecks and how we can uh, increase capacities and, and achieve a transformation that is needed today in the agri-food system. Uh, then I moved into work in IFPRI. Uh, I worked in IFPRI for 15 years. I was the director of the markets and trade division. Uh, which gave me the opportunity to do a lot of uh, research and to work with a very strong team uh, on trying to figure out uh, how we can bring these solutions in the rural sector in Africa, in South, South Asia, uh, and in Latin America. From there, I decided that I needed to know a little bit more about the private sector role, and especially the donor infrastructure in the world. And that's why I decided to move to the World Bank, where I spent two years as the executive director for Peru, Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Bolivia. Uh, and it was an extremely interesting time because it was a time also of the replenishment of the World Bank, which helped me to understand better how the different parts of the bank, the World Bank Group operate, uh, not only the public side, but also the private side through IFC and also MIGA. Uh, and that uh, allowed me to better understand uh, the infrastructure of, of financing that we have in place in the world uh, after Bretton Woods. And then I decided to move to FAO. Uh, and in FAO, I can combine everything because I have to bring solid evidence uh, to create impact in the ground and also yeah. to better understand the financing that is required behind it. What actually inspires you and gives you hope that uh, we can turn around some of the enormous challenges we're facing in the food system? Look, I, I honestly think that every crisis is an opportunity and every crisis will help us to create the changes that are needed. A lot of our problems are related to governance failure uh, and to lack of coordination among the stakeholders. And that's why uh, one of your pillars of the donor platform uh, on coordination of support is so important because that's where I see the, me the major challenge. So there is su significant support in the world for the challenges that yeah. we are facing, but because of lack co of coordination, it becomes completely disaggregated and sparse rather than to focus in certain key priorities that will help to do the transformation. Global food prices are at an all-time high, um, which has huge impacts on, on many countries and many poorer households. So yeah, can you just give us a bit of a sense of how serious you see this current food price uh, rise? And, you know, in your view, how does that compare to the 2008 uh, situation, uh, which really shocked the world uh, as well? Are we, are we managing to cope with this situation better from what was learned in 2008? And you know, what do you see as the longer-term outlook for this current you know, extreme uh, increase in food prices. Okay, so I think we need to look at uh, historically at uh, three periods, the 75, the 70s, where mm -hmm. there was a significant crisis because of the scarcity, the 2007, 2008, which was combined with the financial crisis and the 2011 uh, food crisis. And today, what are the similarities? The similarities is like in 2007, 2008, 2011, and in the 70s, the problem was that because of climate shocks, a significant part of the production disappeared. Uh, today, the story is different. There is a significant part of the share of exports that has uh, stopped being distributed, not because it's not produced, it's because of the conflict and the war, which is not allowing that commodity to move out of Ukraine and, and, and Russian Federation. The other similarity and difference is in 2007, 2008, uh, 2011, uh, and in the 70s, it was mostly based on maize, wheat, uh, soybeans, and rice. Today, rice is not a problem. Uh, this year, the surpluses of rice are very high. Uh, and the stocks of rice are high. And this is good because it's one of the thinnest markets. But today we have another commodity, which is a risk, which is uh, oil seeds. And why is this? Because Russian Federation and Ukraine export 63% of sunflower to the world. 
The, the other element which is really different in this opportunity is the linkages between energy and fertilizers. And therefore, if the price of gas goes up, the price of the production of nitrogen goes up, and that increases the prices of fertilizers. And the food prices have not been increasing to the level that make it profitable. So affordability of fertilizers has decreased substantially because of this energy relationship. That we did not have uh, in, in 2007-2008. In 2007-2008-2011, we were talking of a year of a choke. But now, if fertilizers are not being able to distribute to the world, we will be affecting the next planting season, and that could have uh, significant, uh, significant impacts. What do you think the outlook for this current situation is, and how dramatic is it going to be in, in affecting poverty levels? Look, just because of COVID-19 in 2020, our projections was that the increase in the chronic undernourishment will go up to 161 million more people chronically undernourished. Right. The World Bank number for extreme poverty was an increase in 97 million people more in extreme poverty, which was basically losing a decade of reduction of extreme poverty in the world. Now, the crisis today uh, and the exacerbation of the crisis of COVID-19 because of the war in Ukraine could increase this even more. Our projections in the more extreme scenario, which is where we are getting close now, uh, assuming the shock is only this year, was up to 17 million more people going into chronic undernourished. Now, the effects of this could take two or three years more it depends on how long the choke uh, and the conflict continues, and it will depend on how much uh, the destruction affects the infrastructure for Ukraine to recover. For example, if there is, a, a, there is contamination, nuclear contamination in the land of Ukraine, we are removing Ukraine from production for 10 years. Maximo, could you give us sort of a few ideas about what a more resilient system looks like in practice and how far away from that are we? So the first element of resilience is to understand that we live in this world of uncertainties and risk, and we need to have early warning tools to be prepared. We need to have a One Health approach to be ready and to try to minimize those risks of zoonotic diseases. And we need to have a mechanisms of insurance in place, which has to be market oriented. The second component of, of resilience is how much I can handle the choke when it occurs. And that is what we call the absorption capacity. And the third element of resilience is how I build back, how I reconstruct. Once I have the choke, I have some predictive power. I can absorb part of the choke, how I build back better, how I reconstruct. In the world of the exports of commodities of food, especially on cereals, the world is highly concentrated. There are very few countries, five countries, that basically concentrate all the exports of these commodities. This has improved a little bit from 2007 to 2008, but has not improved sufficiently. And we don't have the geographical disparity that we need to be able to assure that we have that uh, reduction of risk at the global level in case of a shock. Now, the second element is that we are also in an environment where because of climate change, the, the potential shocks, not necessarily man-made, but because of climate change, uh, could increase. What does resilience mean when you're talking about a poor household and, and how they can actually cope with this situation? And the three ways of looking at it, I think, which is very linked to reduction of inequalities, that's the source of improving and making more resilient at the household level, is one is human capital, how we can improve access to human capital so that people are more prepared and can do other options. The second one, which we have evidence about it around the world, is infrastructure. The more infrastructure you have available, the better your capacity to, to recover. Uh, and the third one, which is basically what we call a match of capabilities. So how much your capabilities uh, are matching what the labor demand will require for you to respond. The Global Donor Platform in response to the UN Food System Summit has produced this white paper. I mean, one of the key areas it does talk about is coordination, but I wonder whether there's a few other things in the white paper you might like to pick out that you feel as being particularly important for donors to focus on. No, I think the, the white paper uh, has areas uh, of action, no? So the coordination is one of those, mobilize responsible investment, uh, promote private sector engagement, support uh, policy innovation, invest in research and, 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 and data, enhance uh, 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 governance uh, and so on and so forth. All those pillars are extremely important, but they are guidelines. They are pillars of, yeah. of guidelines. What I think uh, needs to move next to it is operational, making them operational. H how we can really make sure that these principles or these areas of action are implemented uh, in real life, no? How we can bring more accountability to what donors do in the world and what the IFI is doing in the world, what the IMF does in the world, 
how we can enhance that governance mechanism because most of the boards of these institutions are managed by developed countries. And how important do you think this idea about developing national food systems transformation pathways at, at the national level? The, the good thing of the summit was that it bring, brought up the importance of looking at a system approach. No? Uh, and what the transformation pathways documents that every country is working and has working, uh, we have more than 100 transformation pathway documents and we are analyzing them in a lot of detail using uh, our data lab, uh, uh, is telling us that there are some priorities that countries have in place. Now, of course, these transformation pathways documents need a lot of work and need to keep improving, but it's, give, it's starting to bring some flashlights of areas where we not necessarily as global players were aware and which countries, of course, are aware of the changes they need to do. So I think they could be extremely useful information source of what is the real demand at the country level, what are the challenges they are facing to which the whole donor system and the IFI system has to respond, but also bring the importance of the intersectorality, no? because this is not only agricultural, it's also finance, it's also environment and health. How do we get the balance right between investing in the short-term crises and, and humanitarian issues versus investing in the, the longer-term transformation of food systems? Yeah, we have to be very careful here because uh, we cannot convert all the money available into just emergency response. We have to convert it into, of course, emergency response for the most vulnerable, but we also need to bring attached to that as part of, of emergency and as part of increase of resilience of those countries into investment that could give you returns in terms of agricultural production. It's a lot more efficient to, for example, right now in Ukraine, uh, to keep producing, to feed their own people, than to just provide cash transfers to everybody. If I am able to produce a harvest, I can feed a household and feed a community for the whole year while the cash transfers or the delivery of food will only be for one day.